Good evening, everyone. Oh, this is very loud. They'll keep you awake. <laughs> we have lots of things to keep you awake tonight, I think. Uh, welcome to the Blockchain Revolution evening at Willamette University. My name is Carol Long. I'm Provost and Senior Vice President here at the University. We are so delighted to have such a wonderful audience tonight of students, faculty, alumni, community members. It's great to see you all here. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we're also really lucky tonight to have the CoinMe team and a variety of others with us. Our evening will be a little presentation from CoinMe. Me, you'll hear more. Uh, then we'll shuffle around a little bit, have a few more people up on the stage, and have a, a little um, discussion with a panel of experts. Uh, then there'll be some question and answer with you all. And then we'll say good night for the evening and hope that you go away with a great deal of excitement. Um, tonight, we're very happy to have with us uh, Nathan Love and Neil Bergquist, who are dual degree uh, grads and alumni of Willamette. They have the BA MBA. Um, Nathan actually has a title that I covet at CoinMe. <laughs> um, he, he is called uh, the head of crypto, uh, crypto Advisory Services. Did I get that right, Nathan? Yeah, so I, I kind of want that title. I think it's nicer than provost, don't you? <laughs> head of Crypto Advisory Services. Yeah, so that's my new title. Um, he also ran in the New York Marathon, you know, last weekend. I'm not going to do that. I just want his title. <laughs> Neil is an entrepreneur who in 2014 started um, CoinMe, which is the first, um, let's see, licensed Bitcoin ATM company in the US. Um, they're joined by their colleague J.R. Willett, whom some may know as the father, the inventor of the ICO, the initial coin offering. Um, he says he's famous with some people and not with others, but I think he's pretty famous with us tonight. So help me welcome these three gentlemen, and they'll tell us a little bit about CoinMe. We'll do the presentation and then we'll do the, the panel. So we're, we'll start off, excuse me, we'll start off with a presentation and then we have a panel. Um, but really this is your time. So we just want to give you some understanding of blockchain technology, cryptocurrencies, and then give you an opportunity to really dive in and see where these use cases are because uh, this technology is, is frankly game changing and we're still early and there's a lot of opportunity here. So um, it definitely uh, benefit and opportunity for those who get it first uh, to be able to build applications on the blockchain. So coin me uh, real quick. Uh, I was formerly running an incubator in Seattle and frankly I was in the right place at the right time. A lot of the smartest people in the room were really excited about Bitcoin and blockchain technology back in 2013. Uh, I dove in and uh, ended up having some relationships with the regulators, taught them about Bitcoin and blockchain technology, say, hey, we want to protect the consumer. They said, so do we, great. Ended up updating the old money transmitter law and became the first licensed Bitcoin ATM in the United States. For those of you who are familiar with Bitcoin, it doesn't always have the prettiest history. Uh, it was frankly the wild, wild west. Um, maybe a few more wilds on that. Um, but anyone could be a, an entrepreneur in this space anywhere in the world. And now you're moving money around the world. And there's reasons why we have a thing called the Bank Secrecy Act and the US Patriot Act. It's because not everyone's a good actor moving money around the world. So because we wanted to bring this technology to mass market, it was obvious we had to clear the regulatory environment and provide a safe place for consumers, the mass market, to be able to engage in cryptocurrencies and financial services on the blockchain because it provides limitless potential and can really uh, democratize money and help evolve that for a, a new world. So it's definitely a, a, a learn fast, move fast environment. So excited to share with you some things that uh, I've learned in this space. Um, and then we can dive in, ask questions and really try to figure this thing out. Frankly, our, our, our goal here is just to peak interest. Um, you're not gonna obviously learn everything and we're gonna throw a lot at you, uh, but as, hopefully you have a hook. Uh, a hook, a passion to learn more and dive in um, in your respective area of interest. So anyways, CoinMe, we're a blockchain technology company. We operate a network of crypto ATMs across the United States. Uh, we also have crypto advisors uh, who are your trusted asset, digital asset advisors to help you buy and sell digital goods, digital assets. Manage it like a portfolio similar to a financial advisor at Merrill Lynch or Goldman Sachs. Um, we are on a mission to facilitate the evolution of money. Um, money has obviously been around for a long time. 
Uh, I think whale teeth were the first form of money. Um, and then obviously evolved in the bartering system to golds and silvers and then fiat currencies. Well, the world's evolved, money should evolve as well. And in fact, when Bitcoin came out in 2009 by a guy named Satoshi Nakamoto, no one knows who he is, where he is, is he real? You know, all part of the fun story of Bitcoin. Um, but just in the last 10 years, Bitcoin has gained adoption. Uh, this is the price of Bitcoin. Uh, everyone likes to talk about the price of Bitcoin. Uh, this is really just uh, an optics thing. It doesn't say a ton except for the fact that it has adoption and awareness. Um, early on, uh, it just graph starts in 2013. So CoinMe, actually, uh, we were bandwagoners. Uh, Bitcoin went up to $1,000, like this is amazing, we're jumping in, and then it like came down and we thought we were just too late. Well, you know, bandwagons tend to repeat themselves sometimes. Uh, so then last fall it went up to $20,000, uh, now it's plateaued down to around $6,500, um, and it's more or less stabilized in its space. Anyone here own Bitcoin? Anyone here, keep your hands up, anyone here own Bitcoin in 2017, 2016, 2015? 14. All right, Stephen Thor said, here's your donors. Let's, let's get on this. Uh, no, it's great. It's, and, you know, it, and I will say this, it's still early. Uh, just take your time to understand it and see if it's something that makes sense for you. But for us as a company that's in the business of exchanging digital currencies, we're not speculating on the future price of Bitcoin or any digital asset. We're speculating that people are going to use these. Use these because they solve real world problems. This is a graph of the daily transactions. This is the graph that matters. People are using it. There's about 250,000 transactions a day on the Bitcoin blockchain alone. There's about 2,000 different cryptocurrencies. This is just Bitcoin, the biggest one, which has about 50% of the market cap. It's a picks and shovels business model. Uh, so as a business, we make money when people buy, we make money when people sell. So we like to see people using it. There's a great website called coinmarketcap.com. It actually has a list of all the different cryptocurrencies, their market caps, where they're trading at. Um, here's just a snapshot of the top 10. You've probably heard of some of these. Um, but cryptocurrencies have been developed for different use cases. There's one called Monero, which really is trying to appeal for anonymity. Uh, there's one called XRP, which is really trying to be used for money transmission between the banks. It's better than the SWIFT process or the bank wire process. So each of them have their own caps and their own use cases, um, but it's all digital assets on a blockchain. That's what they all have in common. For us, our flagship product, the kiosk, so why does this matter? How is this relevant? This creates a physical portal into the digital world that the mass market trusts. So you go to a kiosk, you're used to maybe walking into a bank to create a bank account. Well, now you have a physical representation of this magic internet money. Uh, so it's two clicks, it's cash to Bitcoin, Bitcoin to cash. You can send money anywhere in the world. There's $120 billion a year that's transferred outside the United States through companies like Western Union. Uh, now with, uh, you know, I don't know where your political leanings are, but with Trump in office, there's more people who are uh, maybe not uh, citizens who don't want to use bank accounts or people who are citizens who are afraid to use bank accounts because then there's some control over their money and their assets. So we actually have a lot of customers that live in cash and Bitcoin, uh, to my surprise. More than 20% of Americans don't have bank accounts, uh, in large part because of this fear uh, aspect. And the reality is banking, banks have left a large segment of the population behind. Two and a half billion people in the world don't even have a bank account. So for this kiosk, this is a way to build a platform so that people can buy, sell, store, send, receive digital currencies. It's bringing it into the real world so people actually use it. We currently have 70 machines across the United States uh, and we're expanding rapidly. We're actually, now that 2017 happened and now a lot of the large companies are excited about this space, we have uh, just signed a licensing deal where we'll be able to put our technology and crypto enable about 8,000 kiosks across the United States here uh, in next year. So we're super excited about that. It's a big mass market play. There'll be a CoinMe ATM located within five miles of 90% of Americans. So now there's infrastructure and that's what has not existed to date. Uh, there's now massive amounts of infrastructure. Companies like Coinbase raising $300 million at an $8 billion valuation, and they're five years old. Uh, these companies are growing extremely fast and building this infrastructure so that the mass market can use digital currencies in their everyday life. And I'll tell you why they're going to do that here in a minute. 
Um, the other side of our business is the trusted advisor, the group that Nathan Love heads up. Uh, you can't call Goldman Sachs and buy one of the best performing asset classes over the last 10 years. It's a crime. Uh, it's because they're a bank and banks are very cautious and banks uh, have their own business model and this could be very disruptive to that business model. Uh, but you can call us. So we have become a digital asset brokerage in that sense. We look at your portfolio. We recommend that three to 5% of your total net worth be in digital assets. Um, so think about that, consider it. It's good to have exposure um, and Nathan can tell you much more about that. But that's been a really interesting product and service for us to offer to the market. And we can do that in about 30 of the 50 US states based on licensing laws. So let's pause there on CoinMe and then let's zoom back out and let's talk about the blockchain. What is the blockchain? It's a, it's a hype, it's a buzzword, it's you know, all of those things that uh, new technology is here with AI and big data and um, all these other trends. The reason why this one's significant and which is you know, why you're all here is really three key innovations. One is cryptography. Cryptography is really solves the problem of online trust and the double spend problem. So how do you know that when someone's online that they really are who they say they are? And so then if you can solve trust through cryptography, which is encryption with private keys and a public wallet, you can prove who you are through this private key encryption. This is essentially your password to a wallet. That wallet stores Bitcoin. So if you have control to that wallet, you control your Bitcoin and then you can process an order to anyone anywhere in the world. And that's trusted and it's really a math innovation. So because of cryptography, we can now move money on the internet. That hasn't been done before. I mean, why are we still using debit and credit cards online? Uh, they don't make sense. That's why they're expensive. The second key innovation is really the idea of a decentralized network. So centralized is pretty much everything we see in our world today. There's a central authority, a governing body, a board of directors. They control the system. A decentralized system is one where there is no central control, but distributed decentralized control. So in the, in the world of a blockchain, that decentralized control is a bunch of different computers that process the same blockchain with a shared rule set. And when a transaction happens on that blockchain, these different processors validate it. And once three or five, depending on times, validate it, then it gets processed on the blockchain and all the computers update their public ledger. And the public ledger is really the third key innovation here. Every transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain is public. So if I have your wallet address, I can plug that into a blockchain explorer and I can see every transaction that's ever happened in that wallet address. It's very transparent. Now, you may not know who owns that wallet, and that's where you can pull in some anonymity into this space. But licensed exchanges, excuse me, licensed exchanges like ours, we have to do know your customer on every customer so we know who owns that wallet. So if that wallet does anything illicit, enforcement agents come to us, we say, well, here's their KYC info, if that were to happen. So it's important that the on-ramps and off-ramps are licensed and regulated to keep bad actors out, um, but you can still have a wallet somewhere, somewhere in the world and still be able to move anything around. And, it, and I'm talking about the use case of money, obviously a lot of other use cases where you can move stores of value or things around. So to go back, let's get a little more technical here. So let's start off with an example. So someone wants to do a transaction. Person A wants to send a, unit, a stored value to person B. So they process that on a computer. The computer then broadcasts that out to all those nodes, so all those different servers. All the servers say, yes, that is a legitimate transaction, and they verify it. Once it's verified, they all agree, which is the check marks, and then it goes into a block. So there's where we finally get into the blocks. So a block is a certain size, and the size of that block can hold a certain number of transactions. Un unfortunately, the Bitcoin blockchain is slow. And it's because it's going a lot faster than it was intended to do. Satoshi Nakamoto, the inventor, was actually just, this is just an experiment, version 1.0. I'm just going to launch this thing. And then it just took off like wildfire. 
So it's actually pretty slow. So you might hear the debate, how do we make the blocks bigger or faster so we can process more transactions? So that you might be familiar with that debate that's going on in the Bitcoin community. And now here's the problem of a decentralized authority. There's no one person to make the decision. So now you have this huge debate waiting on 90% consensus to decide how to update the Bitcoin blockchain for evolution. So very fascinating from kind of a governance perspective. So anyways, once a block is full, the block goes on the blockchain, gets processed, gets attached to all the other blocks. So you can actually see on the Bitcoin blockchain every transaction since the very first one from Satoshi Nakamoto. Pretty fascinating. And then it gets processed. Now obviously this is built on the internet, so there's certain advantages associated with that, uh, which is very important. Um, but with that, since we live in a digital world, those advantages extend beyond cryptocurrencies. So this is a, a graph from Deloitte that talks about the different use cases with the blockchain technology. So you all may have different passions or you all do have different passions. This can be utilized in a lot of different ways. When the internet first came out, it was really the fact that the internet was disrupting everything. Every industry was going to be impacted by the internet. The same analogy is, is holding true for blockchain. Every industry is going to be impacted in some way, shape or form by blockchain technology. I'm just talking about one use case, that's cryptocurrency, that's money, that was the first use case. But if you separate Bitcoin from the blockchain, well what if we put a medical record on that blockchain? Now we can move medical records around in a decentralized fashion. What if I were to do supply chain and put a good on that blockchain? Can I process those transactions faster? What if I put identity on the blockchain? The UN is actually sending money on the blockchain because it's more efficient than giving it to the centralized government of some African country where then only a little bit of that money actually trickles down to the people. But the UN can now say, hey, you all verify your identities on the blockchain and now you get aid on a blockchain and now there's 100% money from me to you. Uh, it's a more efficient system. So it's very exciting, all these different use cases, but we're not going to cover all those. The panel will talk about some of those different use cases. What I want to just do a, a further deep dive in to is the cryptocurrency use case. Um, so every great business solves big problems. Uh, every great technology solution has to have a big problem to solve. The problem that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are solving uh, is a little bit multifaceted, but number one is fiat currencies are subject to inflation. Bitcoin has a fixed supply. It can't, it can't be subject to inflation. Whereas in the United States, uh, quantitative easing, where you just print more dollars, anyone who owns dollars, they're now worth less because there's now more dollars in supply because of the centralized decision making. Reality is uh, actually only about 40% of Americans own stocks and bonds. So when you print money, stocks and bonds go up, but dollars go down. So it actually increases the divide between the rich and poor. Well, with Bitcoin, fixed supply. You can't print money. The other thing is that the system to move that money around is an analog system. Uh, it's slow and it's inefficient. And then also within those countries, the centralized control of money. I don't think Venezuela has done a good job managing their money. I don't know about you. But there's problems. There can be problems with centralized control of money. Uh, Alan Greenspan, in the absence of the gold standard, there is no way to protect savings from confiscation through inflation. There is no safe store of value. Two years later, Bitcoin was invented. Now, this is a serious problem that exists across the world. Here's a graph of different countries' fiat currencies and their inflation rates. The codes are a little bit distorted, but the takeaway here is inflation is everywhere. We're a little bit uh, immune to it because of the almighty dollar. Uh, it's strong, it's consistent for the most part, um, but in other countries, they don't have a safe store of value. And actually, some of the earliest adopters in Bitcoin and those that are really driving this market right now aren't even in the United States. Uh, South America, South Africa, Mexico, Argentina, Venezuela. Um, these countries want a safe store of value. It's a human right to have fair money, safe money. They want this. This is a problem. And so there's huge demand in those markets. And if you think about the evolution of money and compare it to other forms of a store of value, actually Bitcoin compares pretty well. Um, it's obviously better than a barter system, which isn't very divisible. I mean, how do you divide up whale teeth unless you have a saw with you or something? Uh, acceptable, I don't know if everyone takes the same thing in a bartering system. 
Uh, they don't, which so is often interchange. Well, then we had precious metals. Well, we can all agree that there's a limited supply of those metals, so let's assign a value to them and let's use that as a medium of exchange. Well, now you're carrying around gold, storing gold, dividing gold uh, isn't very efficient as well. And then you have fiat currencies. Let's get a bunch of gold, put it into a bank, and then issue notes based on the value of that gold, which was the gold standard, which doesn't exist anymore. But let's have those notes represent some form of value, and that's a fiat currency backed by the government. The value of that fiat currency is directly correlated to the strength of that government, hence Venezuela and some of these issues with inflation. They have to print more money to fund their debt, et cetera. We don't need to go down the rabbit hole of central banking. But if you look at Bitcoin, it actually stacks up pretty well. It's highly divisible, globally transferable, it's durable, there's a fixed supply, it's secure, it's never been hacked. Um, private keys have been stolen, and so people's Bitcoin has been stolen, but the blockchain itself has never been hacked. It's not sovereign, it's decentralized, and it's smart and programmable. And we'll get a little bit into the smart contract aspect. But if you think about it, Bitcoin actually is already performing as a better form of money, of a trade, of, of a medium of exchange. Medium of exchange. So why are we using debit and credit cards online? Well, the reality is it's because we all have them, we already had them and they work for the most part, and we all like free miles. The reality, but the problem is, it costs the merchant two to three percent to accept a debit or credit card. Two to three percent because it doesn't work, it's inefficient. That two to three percent goes to pay for chargebacks. That's people paying for something and then claiming that they want their money back, and then it costs the merchant and the credit card company money. Fraud, you know, these companies have to have huge fraud departments. That costs money, so that's why it's two to three percent. Cryptocurrencies, there is no fraud. There are no chargebacks. It's built on the internet, so it works because it has a trust layer. Debit and credit cards, there's no trust. You can steal debit and credit cards quite easily. With that trust comes efficiency, and with efficiency comes reduced fees, 1% or less. So if you're Amazon and the majority of your revenue comes from debit or credit cards and you can accept cryptocurrencies and then you just reduced that 2 to 3% processing fee to 1% or less, that's significant. If you are also doing microtransactions, there's always a limit on the debit or credit card, right? But with Bitcoin or blockchain or cryptocurrencies, you can do pennies. You can do microtransactions. So there's actually some interesting use cases where individuals, well, let's say they're standing in line, will look at their phone and maybe answer a few surveys and make you know, X number of pennies a minute for doing that or a second for doing that. And now you can actually have a payment mechanism for that. Previously, there was no payment mechanism for microtransactions. So it's interesting how that's come to fruition. Moving money, Western Union, Zoom.com, or Zoom, excuse me, yeah, Zoom and MoneyGram, they're charging about 10 to 12% uh, on money transmission uh, outside the United States. You can go to one of our machines or a Bitcoin ATM and you can send cash anywhere in the world for around 5%, so half. That's significant because if you're Mexico and you're getting $28 billion a year from the United States, and 10 to 12% of that is going to these large companies, which are doing very well, $6 billion in revenue for Western Union, uh, 1.3 operating profit, very well. They've been doing it for 60 years. If you were to actually do all that money sent home through cryptocurrency, it would increase Mexico's GDP by 0.01%. That's significant, especially when you have 6% inflation. Uh, I think everyone would like to get a 0.01% bump. So you can see how these can be very disruptive. You can see the problems that these things are solving. And because of this disruptive nature, because this new technology can now solve problems that could never be solved before, there's this new funding mechanism, now called an initial coin offering or a token sale. JR, uh, his, uh, his claim to fame is that he did the first token sale in history. Uh, so he took the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, mirrored it, put a new asset, changed the new blockchain, uh, it was called MasterCoin, and then created a new asset and put on it, it had different rules, it performs better than Bitcoin, it's faster, it's smarter, it program, those types of things. So he built that and then and, uh, did a coin offering. So I'm going to create this new asset on this new coin and I'm going to sell it in a crowd sale for a duration of time. With that money that comes in, I'm going to use that money to further build out this, pl this protocol, this platform. That's called a token sale. You sell the token, you use the proceeds to further develop the idea. Well, since this has come out, now pretty much anyone anywhere with a address, a, a Bitcoin, Ethereum wallet address, can then say, hey, here's my white paper, here's my idea, send Bitcoin here, 
and I'll issue you some of this new token that I'm going to create once it's live. That took off like wildfire. Uh, there's been over $10 billion of, of US valued cryptocurrencies contributed to token sale projects over the last three years. It's, it's, it's hugely significant. If you think about how money is issued to entrepreneurs these days, it's fairly centralized. I mean, sure, there's crowdfunding, but even then, um, you have Kickstarter and GoFundMe and things like that. This takes it to the next level. Anyone, anywhere with an internet connection can now get funded or fund and have upside uh, for the, the return of these projects. So it's pretty significant. It's awesome to see that play out on a global scale. This graph just shows the different countries. Europe has raised, there's companies that have raised a lot of money. North America has raised a lot of money. Um, CoinMe actually did a token sale last fall. Um, it was uh, an experience I don't want to go through again, but essentially you're doing an international roadshow for three months and just presenting ideas and hopefully raising uh, some money in the ends of it. We were able to get about 13 million, but that was at the peak, it's not 13 million anymore, and using that for, for growth to accelerate the vision and mission. So that's called up token. Whenever you go to a CoinMe machine, you get 1% up token back, and then you can use and get 30% off your fees. The analogy I'll use here is imagine if you're an airline with regional flights and you're like, I want to be a global airline. Well, how are you going to get finance to be a global airline? Well, let's create a miles program and let's sell those miles. So customers, future customers buy miles for cheap and then the airline uses the revenue from those mile, not selling all those miles to then add all the flights, but now they have to reward miles equal to how much their people fly. So now they're trying to buy back miles and reward them to their customers. So if you believed in that airline and bought miles, you now have an opportunity, increased utility, increased value. Uh, so that's a, a kind of a creative way of how to accelerate a company's growth. Venture funding in the space has been significant as well, about $5 billion into blockchain technologies. Obviously, if you're a, uh, someone that likes to look at trends and things like that, where the money goes, new products and services, new customers. Uh, so follow the money. There's a ton of money going into blockchain technology. There's also a lot of enterprise support as well. You're probably familiar with a lot of companies who accept Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies uh, for payments or building their own blockchains. Uh, these are obviously well-known companies. Overstock was one of the first, and actually their share price has gone up because of this, because they've accepted so much money in Bitcoin. Um, and you also have companies like Fidelity, $7 trillion under asset, assets under management. And they're now launching a custody digital asset brokerage. So as these bigger companies get more on, on board, you can imagine adoption is going to continue to follow with that. This is the regulatory landscape. It is legal to buy Bitcoin. There's actually about 30% of people in the United States who don't even know if it's legal or not to buy Bitcoin kind of just as a representation of how early we are. The mass market's still getting up to speed on this. The only place that, uh, that Bitcoin is, is purely banned is China, although there's some edge cases, but China obviously wants to control their people and their money, and they're not going to be doing cryptocurrencies unless they own it. Um, Russia is a little bit of a gray area. India is a little bit of a gray area. Um, but for the most part, I mean, it's, an, it's become an open map. Um, so as long as you follow uh, a KYC AML program, get the respective licenses in those countries, you can now bring cryptocurrencies to the mass market. Uh, if you look at adoption, uh, millennials, uh, you know, surprise, um, are the ones that have adopted this the most. About 50% of millennials uh, in the U.S. own some form of cryptocurrency. And actually, some recent polls have shared that millennials are more likely to speculate on the value of cryptocurrencies than they are stocks. Um, which is, again, hugely significant. Uh, NYU, the Stern School of Business, in 2014 offered a class uh, to people to learn about blockchain technology. 35 people signed up in the first year. Now there's 240 people in the class, and it's in the largest auditorium, um, obviously all college-age students. Uh, millennials are the ones driving change. They're driving this innovation as well. Uh, user growth, uh, Coinbase's user growth, user growth is consistent month over month regardless of the price. Uh, same thing with the blockchain wallet user growth is significant. Uh, our user growth has been consistent as well. Um, people are getting online. People are, are entering this space. And if you look at the adoption of cryptocurrencies and compare it to the adoption of the Internet, it's 1998. Uh, there, in 1998, there was about 3% uh, of people that were online, which sounds kind of low. But let's think about that being global. Now that there's internet connections all the world and people want, are craving a safe store of value, there's about 3% of people in the world own cryptocurrencies. 
That's pretty significant. In the United States, about 10%. Japan's the number one country at about 13%. Um, so people are coming online in the wonderful world of cryptocurrencies. And it's 1998, uh, which is a pretty exciting space. So in the world of innovation, whenever you build something new, there's certain people that probably aren't going to benefit from that. Um, you know, there's this kind of joke when you're a startup that, you know, the incumbents, the powers that be, you know, first they uh, uh, ignore you, then they bash you, and then they try to join you. Uh, Jamie Dimon has uh, put himself in a position of being that guy. Um, he is CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, um, and he came out pretty strongly and said, Bitcoin is fraud. It's not a real thing. Eventually it'll be closed. September of 2017. I don't know if you remember that price graph but Bitcoin is like $5,000, and then three months later it was $20,000, purely because of adoption. Uh, and so then Jamie in, in January says, I regret making that comment. Bitcoin was always to me what the governments are going to feel about Bitcoin when it gets really big. Okay, so now he's on board. Uh, so first he bashes you, and now he's you know, eating his words and trying to join as well. But he's right, though, in the sense that it's going to be really interesting to see how cryptocurrencies play out uh, with governments that don't necessarily have a safe store of value, countries where people would rather own a cryptocurrency than the government's fiat currency that has a lot of national security concerns and implications. It's still in the experiment stages, more or less, uh, but it's fascinating to watch it play out real time on a global scale. And really, that's why we're all here together, is just to keep learning, keep understanding what's happened, where is this going, and it's, it's really fascinating just to watch this unfold. So again, here's back to all the other different use cases. That was just cryptocurrency. What happens when we start doing medical records, supply chain, identity, programmable contracts, decentralized apps? That's just cryptocurrency. Uh, so it's going to be really fascinating to see where this thing goes. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Neil. You've really got us all eager now to hear all these different uses of, of uh, the blockchain. And so we'll invite some more people up to join the panel up here. Um, we have Jason Gershenson, who has his JD from Willamette in 2011. He's now a, a lawyer in New York, uh, practicing in tech law. Don Negri, Willamette Professor of Economics. Robert Walker, AJSM or Atkinson, Associate Professor of Quantitative Methods, and Jameson Watts, uh, Atkinson, Assistant Professor of Marketing. If you'd all please join us on the stage. And Nathan will be the moderator of the panel. Great. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is actually really amazing. We, uh, well, as a, as a former student here, uh, ate four years of breakfast at Cat Cavern here after a track cross-country workout. So it's a great time to be back and uh, really appreciate the panel. Um, I think this is the first time actually joining the three undergrad, you know, having the law school, the business school, undergrad, as well as some high school students in the audience, as well as alumni who have our community members in Portland, Seattle, uh, and Salem here joining us. So it's really exciting. And um, I think we have a, a great discussion. Thank you, Neil, for starting this off. Really um, just want to start off and uh, go down um, and say, like, uh, how did you get into this field? And what are you excited about with blockchain, cryptocurrency, specifically blockchain economics? <laughs> go from here. So I'll start off. Um, I'd rather focus a little bit more on Bitcoin because um, I know a little bit more about currency than I do about the technology associated with blockchain. Um, <clears throat> my first learned about uh, Bitcoin uh, about a year ago when a student of mine asked if he could do a, a thesis, a senior thesis on Bitcoin. And I said, sure, what is it? And uh, sure enough, uh, he did a, he did a, a thesis and I I, that was the beginning of my education on what Bitcoin is and what blockchain technology is. And it took me almost a year uh, to get up to speed on its relationship to the economy and um, 
The other question you asked me was, what am I excited about? Yes. Um, this technology has the potential, much like the internet, to create a great deal of wealth. Uh, we saw that uh, there's a, a number of uh, companies in the world who have made enormous amounts of money in, uh, in digital, with digital technology, and yet that money wasn't very equitably distributed. Um, it is my hope that I can excite students about thinking about ways in which uh, this next uh, disruptive technology uh, can be more equitably, the wealth that it creates can be more equitably distributed and uh, contribute to a more <coughs> equal distribution of wealth in this country. That's what I would like to That's great. mention. Thank you. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, I'm <laughs> sorry. I, I'm Don Negri. I'm in the Department of Economics here. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm Jameson Watts. I'm a uh, assistant professor um, at the Atkinson School. Um, so you want to know what I, what I like about this stuff? Probably two things. Um, the first thing is, is I like uh, all of the new products that are, are possible. So uh, blockchain seems to work in places where you have really heavy transaction costs. So you can think like real estate, um, Anywhere where trust is really important, like developing a relationship is really important, you're gonna have a lot of cost there. Um, so you have a lot of situations where you can have kind of new products, right, that are coming, um, hopefully eliminating realtors. Um, don't go into real estate. Um, <laughs> but I think on the other side, um, uh, Data provenance, right? So um, how do I own my data? Neil talked about medical records. It's not just that you're walking around with a cell phone. Uh, someone is making money on your movement, right, around the country. And um, you should own that. Or if not own it, at least um, be aware of it and have control over um, how it gets used. And I think blockchain is... is uh, probably a great place to start in solving that problem. That's great. Legal perspective? Or introduce yourself, sorry, so as well. Hi, I'm, I'm Jason Gershenson. Um, I'm, I'm a, a, a tech and uh, corporate securities attorney. And um, I got into blockchain and Bitcoin uh, in 2013 when I was, uh, it's back when I used this site called Reddit that um, there's, <laughs> there's a group on there um, a forum on there that was discussing this uh, this case, this investigation that was of national interest, and I was taking a personal interest in it. And the group was like, "All right, let's let's make a, a FOIA request for the um, the documents from I think it was the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Office." And I said, "Well, I'll, I'll send it out, and it cost twenty bucks." And I let them know, and. Uh, so they started sending me um, tips through the messages on, on the platform in Bitcoin. And it said, click through here to, um, to claim your Bitcoin. Do you accept it? And messaging them back, like, what the heck is this? You know, it's like internet money. And uh, so that was um, when uh, Coinbase came out. So they, they showed me that, thank you, um, to, to uh, set up a wallet on there and, and go through um, the whole process to, to, to get that set up. So I'm curious about it. I, I, I look into it, see, see what, what it does and what it is. And I also see the price going up drastically, like every month. It's, and that's, I think, what got me extremely interested in it as like an investment. And um, I, I, ever since then, I've kind of been learning as much as uh, I can about uh, blockchain and applications. and. Um, a few years ago, uh, I guess I didn't expect it to happen so, so soon for the, the, the path to, to cross into the, the work that I did in securities where uh, the, the bull run of last year and then the ICOs that really took off the year before that um, is, uh, kind of came into um, to my, my realm with, uh, um, with tech clients that were, were issuing um, coins to raise money. Uh, like like we just saw in the presentation, and uh, at, at the firm I work at, the the partners are are, are saying, well, th they they want to do these ICOs. What is this? And I was like, I know this. I I know blockchain, and um, it was it was exciting to really um, 
move into that field uh, professionally. So that's kind of my story with, uh, with, with blockchain. Great. Thank you. JR, you're mic'd up. Go ahead. Uh, my name is JR Willett. Uh, I got into cryptocurrency in 2010. Uh, it was a case of sort of being in the right place at the right time with the right interests and uh, the right uh, set of understandings. Um, at that time, uh, Bitcoin was 25 cents. And I got on the Bitcoin forum and people were going crazy. They were saying it had gone from under a penny to 25 cents. This was like the biggest bubble that any of them had ever seen. They're like, this is going to crash. It's going to end in tears. Like, they, like everyone's going to just like, they just couldn't understand like this. Uh, and I had recently been playing with penny stocks. And I, I, I looked at that and I thought, this could go so much higher. <laughs> like, this is just this is tiny compared to what could happen. Uh, and, I, and as I looked into the technology, I started realizing this could destroy destroy the world, like destroy money, destroy contracts, destroy all sorts of things. Like if this destroys everything, like the best thing to do would probably be to own some of it so that I'm not destroyed along with everybody else. So, so I literally bought cryptocurrency defensively. Like that is that. So, um, and so, yeah, I, I, I bought some cryptocurrency then. And I actually, I, I, I instead of buying it directly, uh, I, I got into mining, so I, uh, I basically went on Craigslist and I, I, I recruited people to mine for me. Uh, I didn't want to tell them what I was doing, so I was a, a computer science guy, so I, I took the Bitcoin mining software and I hid it inside another program. And I said, I'll pay you monthly to run this software that, that uses your video card, I'm not going to tell you what it's for. Uh, and so I, 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 mostly college students, uh, I don't know why, what's up with you guys, but like they had these gaming rigs and they wanted to pay for their video card and they, so they would wipe their computer and, uh, and they would, and I would pay them monthly and, and, and mine, they didn't know they were mining Bitcoin, but they were. Um, so, and that was 2011 and in 2012 I had this, I, I would lay awake at night, every night and just think what is going to happen next with Bitcoin? Cause if I can predict that, like it's going to be, it'll be, it'll be big, whatever it is. Uh, and so I eventually came up with this idea to take Bitcoin and build another protocol layer on top of it. Uh, if you think about protocol layers, you've got your Ethernet cable, and on top of that, we've got TCP IP, and I'm talking gobbledygook to some of you, I, I'm sorry, but like basically the idea is you can build protocols on top of each other, and each one uses the one underneath. I thought, well, we could use Bitcoin not only as money, but also as a protocol layer. So I came up with a paper on how to build a protocol layer on top of Bitcoin, but one of my problems was, how do I pay for this. Uh, like it's a lot of work, a lot of engineering, and I've got a job, and I've got small children, and I, I don't want to like fly around to all these venture capitalists who already think Bitcoin is a scam. They're not, if they think Bitcoin is a scam, I, I tell them I want to build on top to build Bitcoin something more complicated. They're going to laugh at me. So I, I, I thought, you know, the people that have money and would actually invest in this are my friends on the Bitcoin forum. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to release new coins um, with my new protocol layer, and anybody who sends Bitcoin to a certain address will own the new coins, and that'll, that'll pay for the development of this thing. I didn't really think, I wasn't trying to remake finance. It, you know, Neil showed this billions of dollars ha have been raised that way since then. I, I was just too lazy and, and uh, didn't want to go around and try to raise money from lots of people. So that was 2012. I, I wrote this paper about how to do it. And actually what I wanted was for someone else to do the first ever token sale or ICO. I wanted someone else to do it because I just wanted to be a passive investor. So I said, here's a paper, here's how you do it. Somebody go do it. And I waited 18 months. Nobody did it. I mean, people talked about it. They're like, oh, that's kind of an interesting idea. But like, nobody did it. So finally, 18 months later, I did the first ever token sale or ICO. Uh, that created a, a coin called MasterCoin. It was later renamed to Omni. You may not have heard of Omni, but if you follow cryptocurrencies, you've probably heard of one called Tether. Tether is like the number eight one on Neil's. Te uh, Tether built on top of our protocol on Omni. So be mainly because of Tether, Omni has billions of dollars of tokens running on it now. And that was all created with the first token sale. So. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of excited to see the thing that I built being used. And uh, it's this number two protocol after Ethereum. Ethereum has you know, many, many, many billions of dollars of tokens. But the second one by, by total market cap of tokens is Omni. So that was pretty cool. Um, and then I got involved with Neil and, and these crypto ATMs. And I got really excited about that a few years later. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that brings us up to today. Uh, and what am I excited about? Uh, derivatives. 
Um, <laughs> if you if you make a map of all the money in the world and you like have like well here's the cash and here's like the all the stocks in the world the derivatives like forex does like five trillion dollars a day it, the bubble for for forex is like if you got the planets you know and then you got the sun it's like <laughs> like that's 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 forex so like if if some tiny percentage of all the derivatives trading in the world moves into blockchain it not all the but not all the cryptocurrency in the world is for sale so like it doesn't go you know it, you, you don't you don't buy all the bitcoin in the world for you know however many billion dollars it's worth because not all that's for sale so if a tiny tiny fraction of those trillions and trillions of dollars moves into blockchain the the, the effect on blockchain will be incalculable just it explode in value so yeah I'm, I'm very interested in derivatives trading on the blockchain great thanks Jar. Uh, robert oh boy <laughs> hmm. I, oh great give a college professor a microphone <laughs> and then just watch and laugh as they figure out how to use it <laughs> okay. okay well then i'm going to use the part that works oh there you go i'm just going to use it right <laughs> uh, so where did my interest in blockchain come from? Principally the blockchain. So I'll confess I'm the one who knows nothing about cryptocurrency or almost nothing. Um, and that's because my interest in blockchains is kind of the, the other side, not necessarily money as a store of value, but the way in which, for example, businesses use the blockchain to track supplies. So my kind of favorite use case and example is, um, and part of this comes from things I've been interested in more generally. So by training, I'm a social scientist. And one of the kind of key questions in economics and in politics is questions about trust. And one of the things that blockchains potentially allow us to do is to develop trust in other people on the basis of kind of empirical or, or fact-based demonstrations of trust. If I comply with contracts, you can trust me. If I don't comply with contracts, you can fail to trust me. And this problem has existed and fascinated me since I was in graduate school. It was actually posed to some extent or another by uh, two economists, Doug North and, and Milgram, who both won the Nobel Prize. But it was because information was a paucity. What does the blockchain do? it makes information no longer a paucity. If I own something and I transfer it to you, you not only know that I own it, but you know that I transferred it to you. And so it becomes like kind of completely transparent going both backwards and forwards. Where is this sort of wonderful or potentially life-changing? The examples of me that are most interesting are things like food safety. I produce tomatoes. Maybe my tomatoes pick up, you know, some terrible virus, and that virus transmits its way through the supply chain of food. Why? Because those tomatoes get sold to other people. What can we not now do? Not easily go back from a jar of prepared pasta sauce to an initial contaminated tomato. But what does the blockchain allow us to do? It allows us to reverse that chain of transactions that built the tomato sauce back to the original source of potentially contaminated tomatoes. In other words, it allows us in a very cheap way to solve massive scale societal problems. And to me, as a kind of data person, that's what I want to do. What are the most exciting things about it? I think I kind of would just be repeating myself, so instead I'll just pass. <laughs> He's got Robert. Um, yeah, you can probably guess what I'm excited about. I'm excited about the whole thing. but. Within cryptocurrency, I think what's going to be really interesting to watch is the impact of giving developing countries access to a safe store of value, one that could even go up in value. Um, I, I truly think that it could have a bigger impact on income equality than even microfinance um, because now instead of people losing money over time, our first compliance advisor was from Argentina and he went through four cycles of hyperinflation. He was just furious, obviously. I mean, you work your whole life to watch those, the, the value of, of your savings account just diminish. Um, but now that as infrastructure is, is growing and you look at Africa, you know, it's access to power, it's access to clean water, it's access to healthcare, it's access to the internet. Well, now it's access to financial services. Um, they're unbanked. They're, they're, they're using cell phone minutes as a store of value. Um, there's a huge opportunity here to just a leapfrog and just go straight to banking on the blockchain. Uh, so I'm excited to see the, the economic impact and the cultural impact of that around the world. Yeah, that's great. So economic impact as well as what predictions? Can you give us quick what you think predictions are going to be here? And we'll go down. But like the price of Bitcoin or? Yeah, overall, <laughs> the, the way that the market's moving. Like what do you think for yeah. overall blockchain crypto? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, 
if you think of Bitcoin just as a store of value, you can use a lot of different ways, but just as a store of value, and you look at gold, gold's a $7 trillion market cap of a store of value, and it's expensive to store gold, it's expensive to use gold as a medium of exchange. I mean, you, you use it as a hedge. And there's, Bitcoin's only $100 billion. So $7 trillion, and this is $100 billion, you see there's a lot of room to grow. And this has a fixed supply, whereas, you know, people are still mining gold. Um, the fixed supply of Bitcoin is 21 million. There's currently 17 million in circulation. So 4 million will come under circulation between now and 2140. Uh, so fixed supply demand is increasing every day. So, you know, you do the math. Um, I'm pretty bullish just on Bitcoin. I'm also bullish on UpToken um, uh, just because it's uh, the rewards token for CoinMe. And uh, I have some visibility into where that's going. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm bullish on that as well. Great. Thanks, Neil. Robert. Uh, can I just say all of it sounds like a great yeah. idea? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it's because it's one of these things that's sufficiently early that a large part of presumably why you're all here and why we're all interested in this is because we're figuring out all of the beneficial use cases. It's this wonderful technology that, that promises sort of immutable ledgering systems. And if you can immutably know who owns something and transfers it to something else, like from the perspective of, and I'm gonna steal Don's role as an economist here, like secure property rights are the foundations of capitalism, right? I mean, like Adam Smith was assuming this was going on while he wrote these books, but it turns out whether that's actually true or not is, is something that is mired in the lack of transparency about ownership. And it becomes the case that blockchains and cryptocurrencies sort of satisfy some of those areas of uncertainty and what ultimately happens as a result of uncertainty is that some people make and some people lose. Great. Thanks, Robert. Uh, predictions. Uh, I, I saw a list. Neil mentioned 1998. So I, I saw a list of, of companies that were big internet companies in 1998. <laughs> and I was looking through it, and so many of them I didn't recognize. A lot of them I did recognize. I was like, oh, yeah, I remember they went out of business. They got bought. You know, The, the only ones that were really big you know, significant players today were, I think, Amazon and Yahoo, out of like 100 companies, right? And so I was thinking about that, and, you know, history is just repeating itself. You know, we've got thousands of cryptocurrencies. Um, I can't predict which one's going to be the, you know, the winner or the winners. Um, I can tell you that a lot of them are going to die. Uh, I, I, that's just going to happen. Um, vast, vast numbers of them are going to die. Uh, and, and then whichever ones take over the world, are going to remake economics, money, contracts, uh, it could, it, and, and not necessarily in a good way for everybody. I mean, there may be people terribly harmed uh, by the rise of cryptocurrency. So, um, yeah, I think uh, I think that it, the, the world as we know it, it is not long. <laughs> you know, actually, back in um, when I first found out about Bitcoin, I thought. I think government money has about you know, three to five years before it's dead. So I was wrong about that because government money is still around. It's three to five years later. But I, I, I think my time frame was off. But I, I really think that the days are numbered of, of the sort of the, the government having the ability to just print all the money they want and, and everyone has to use it because there's no other alternative. I think that those days are over. Thanks, sure. I think a lot of the, um, the financial uh, assets that that we have um traditional assets like real estate like stock um ownership of companies or um or, or ownership groups are going to um now be divisible um or accessible to more people on the uh, on the blockchain whether it's through um through a token or some other um some other means so uh cost uh, a couple hundred K to buy um, Berkshire Hathaway, but you could split that up, a share of that up on the blockchain, um, a piece of artwork. Um, there, th that's something that you, you can't actually physically um, split up, but you can have the value of it represented on the blockchain and you can own a piece of, um, of, of a Basquiat and, um, and, and have the, the benefits of the value increasing that way as well. Um, and, and just in a lot of other areas, I think that it's going to um, permanently impact how we we see uh, investment, how we see finances, um, and, and the way that um, uh, by me by means of blockchain and being able to, um, in that example, having a, a smaller share of something that's most 
the vast, vast majority of people could never afford, would never even think about getting now is, is a, um, there's, there's a means to do it um, through, uh, through blockchain. And uh, yeah, I, th I think we're, we're going to be um, fundamentally impacted through this um, not, in, in, not very long. I think it, really the next couple of years um, is, it's going to not be a, uh, a fringe movement or seem like one. It's, it's really going to be in our everyday lives uh, the same way dollars are, the same way the investments that we currently make are. Uh, so I think I'm finally going to get paid for watching commercials. <laughs> and the reason is, right, because um, the system is flipped, right? The system is completely backwards. We put in a search term, we go to Google, and Google tries to predict what we want and then show us a bunch of pop-up ads or whatever it might be, and it's really, really annoying. And I don't get any of the benefit of that except for maybe some of the organic search results that show up next to the ads. Um, if you're owning the data, you're owning your interest in what advertisers uh, can approach you with, right? You can think about a situation where uh, refrigerator companies are bidding to be the top person in your email inbox. And so you are getting paid a little bit every time one of those emails comes into your inbox. Um, you get control of the interest. You get paid for your attention. Okay. Um, my prediction, I gave up my crystal ball many, many years <laughs> ago, and I don't intend to take it out anyway. And it's like those little black things used to turn over, and, the, and you know who Any you're going to love, what's going to come up at the beginning. Yeah, no, I, that, that's gone. Um, I'm, a, I'm much more of a skeptic than uh, my colleagues here, and so let me briefly tell you uh, why I'm a lot more skeptical. So when this student came to uh, see me a year or so ago and said, I want to do a, a thesis on Bitcoin, I, <clears throat> I said, well, what is it? And <clears throat> I started thinking, is it, is it money? And so what I asked was, let's go down the characteristics of money and try to determine whether, in fact, it's money or if it's an asset. Uh, a lot of people are buying uh, Bitcoin in order to make money at, with Bitcoin as an asset rather than as a medium of exchange. So the first thing I asked is, is Bitcoin a medium of exchange? Well, yes and no. You can buy and sell things with it. Uh, but there are some issues. If you, if you go to a store and you hand them your credit card, they get the money, there is this large charge, and, but, but they'll give you the good. If you give them a Bitcoin, ten, it'll take 10 minutes for that transaction to get into the block, and then it'll take another hour-ish for that transaction to be verified. So the owner of the store won't really know whether you've paid for the good uh, for as much as an hour. And that creates some kind of um, difficulty in using Bitcoin as a uh, kind of a retail uh, um, means of, of exchange. The other thing is uh, it's irreversible. If you uh, go online and you order a puppy and a duck arrives at the door uh, the transaction is final. There's no reversing the transaction. You're stuck with the duck. And unless there is government intervention in order to make sure that the uh, system is going to work well, you, you got a duck. Uh, the second thing is that money is supposed to be a unit of account. And indeed, I think uh, Bitcoin is a, a, a reasonable measure of value. The only downside is that it, even as the graph that Neil was showing us, we see a lot of variation in price so that if you use it as a unit of account, the, the things that are measured in Bitcoin value are going to change significantly. Third, everybody is very confident that it's a store of value, uh, but in fact, uh, I see it as fairly risky because I see the lines on that graph going up and down significantly. So I think there's a a good deal of uh, uncertainty and risk associated with it. Um, there's this, <clears throat> the second thing, or the last thing I'll say at the moment is um, 
for those of you who were around in 2008, uh, when we went into a recession, uh, the first thing that the Federal Reserve did was increase the money to supply in order to drop the interest rate, in order to provi provide us with the kind of economy uh, that we're looking at now. To the extent that the central bank doesn't have control of the money supply, uh, the, their ability to uh, change the course of the economy is quite diminished. And uh, in some sense, some countries might like that, but in our country, I think uh, we might even be glad that the central bank had the, the Fed had the ability to lower interest rates and encourage investment uh, in ways that uh, uh, I don't think we could uh, count on Bitcoin to do. S one more thing. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the, the Bitcoin is going to be capped at 20, 21 million Bitcoins. Mm -hmm. Um, the reason we went off the gold standard to, to fiat money is because we were tying our economy to gold, which was in fixed supply. Uh, we also, I mean, in that sense, we also have Bitcoin in fixed supply, and there's really no way to match the growth of the economy with the need to grow the amount of money. And although, the yes, the value will increase, uh, again, I... <coughs> I question that uh, that we would all benefit by uh, some external algorithm determining uh, the, the growth of our money supply. I'm done. Okay. Great. <laughs> Economics. We, we appreciate. So we wanted diversity on this panel. We wanted a little contention. So. There we go. There I we got, go. Thank you I'm so much. Happy to provide so, that. We, and we're going to go back down one last question here. They'll open up the audience for questions because um, I'm sure you guys have a lot. But um, really, the last thing is, you know, students, we have some great alumni, by the way. Thank you for showing up. But we have some great students from the three universities here. We have some uh, high school students that joined us. Um, how, how does this change, you know, Future careers, they're, they're looking at jobs that don't exist yet today, jobs that are just starting that they are not prepared for. H how do you think that this whole blockchain cryptocurrency world affects their future careers from your perspective? From my perspective, um, I'll just uh, recognize that particularly the blockchain technology I see is something that's quite valuable. Um, I, I always, when I sell my house, uh, am very annoyed uh, that the title company takes so much damn money <laughs> when in fact all they're doing is is taking five minutes to go down to the city and determine that yeah it's your house so in, in that sense uh, I'm pretty excited about the future of blockchain uh, again but when I look to the issue of um, the amount of wealth it's likely to create I, I am concerned about how that wealth will be distributed. Uh, because I've seen in the past that other disruptive technologies have created enormous wealth, and yet that wealth has not been equitably distributed throughout the population. Great, thank you. Um, why can't you just return the duck, Don? <laughs> <laughs> Get your puppy. Get your puppy. <laughs> <laughs> because they don't have to take it back. They got their money, and I can't get the money back. Um, <laughs> all right, so the question's about future careers, right? Yes. Um, all right, so uh, I, I think the title company uh, example is actually really apt. And uh, so anywhere there's really thick, um, heavy transaction costs, right? Um, don't go into those professions, <laughs> right? Like, don't go work for a title company. Anywhere, um, anytime you've got some kind of middle person who is taking a lot of money um, in order to kind of move some store of value from one place to another, or even to ensure some store of value, I think um, those sorts of, of jobs can be solved uh, by uh, blockchain technology. Um, so yeah, all the shapes involved from there. I think when deciding, uh, well, whatever field you, you, you go into, and you know, I'm thinking about um, my experience in um, as as a law student. When I was a law student here, um, there there was no talk of blockchain. There was no word to learn about blockchain. Um, no word. There there was no um, path for that that anyone really knew of. Uh, you know, in, anywhere in this field, and or 
for the most part. So um, I'd say to um, go, things are changing really quickly, and if if it is some um, there's some interdisciplinary component to what you want to do, um, learn about it. Ask your um, the dean or the administrator. You know, make make a case for having that. Like if there was a um, intro to JavaScript class that law students could take and, and get credit for it, so they're actually incentivized to go do that. Um, that would be great. And um, for the uh, the administrators and for um, uh, deans of schools, uh, I, I'd say li listen to, um, like Neil said in the presentation, millennials are um, kind of, and then, and then the next generation after that, kind of have the, the pulse on, um, on on what's happening, what's coming next, and to, um, to seriously consider that in any type of uh, interdisciplinary education, because um, it's, it's going to be really important to, um, to know where things are going, to, to have um, opportunity to do what you want to do or to to, um, to to be a lawyer in in 15 20 years like we don't know what that looks like yet but you you can start preparing for that by by um, having some component of what's happening now in the curriculum and um, and be uh, just be aware of what what will be coming next uh, because of that thanks Jason chair uh, career-wise um there are two, two big classes of people that are making tons of money in blockchain right now uh, for as a career. Uh, one is software developers, and I think that should be fairly obvious. There's tons of software type of stuff with blockchain. Uh, and people that are peripheral to software development, product managers and UI people and things like that. Uh, there's a lot of uh, career potential there. The other group that's making a ton of money right now in blockchain is lawyers. Uh, <laughs> Anywhere there's, well, because the, especially with the ICOs, it's created a tremendous amount of legal uncertainty. And any lawyer that is specializing in that legal uncertainty is raking it in right now. I mean, like, you pay $500 an hour just to talk to, you know, the lowest guy on the totem pole at these law firms. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, and if I had talked to a lawyer when, when, I, when I was contemplating the first token sale, they would have said, don't do it, because it had never been done before. And, and lawyers are, are, are typically not going to tell you to do something like that. But I was naive and, and just, just went and did it, and then re later realized when people started saying, I've reported you to the SEC, <laughs> and you're going to go to jail. That's when I realized that maybe I had taken a, a, a perhaps a bigger risk than I thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And thankfully, uh, whoever reads the reports at the SEC was drinking their coffee and like, I don't know what that is. And like, <laughs> they, they never harassed me, but you know, like eventually they started catching on that there's something going on here. And, uh, and lawyers are just raking it in. I don't know if that's sustainable. I think there's a lot of uncertainty right now, and eventually that will probably get resolved. Um, so I wouldn't stake your whole career on that always being the big thing. But um, uh, I don't think if you have an aptitude for software development, I don't think that's ever a bad career choice. And there's, uh, I don't see it getting smaller. Uh, the last thing I'll say about that is even aside from blockchain, software begets software. If you create a whole bunch of software, it has to be maintained, and then you want to replace it with something better. And like it, it's, it's like this, uh, it's, it's a feedback mechanism where the more software you have, the more software developers you need, and the more you create, and it just gets bigger and bigger. And I, I don't see that stopping anytime soon. So. Thanks, Jer. <laughs> Robert. So in a completely self-serving sense, remember that blockchains are digital data and like, I kind of like data. It's sort of what I do. So um, what should you specialize in? Aspects of the digital rather than the real economy. And I think that's actually kind of the theme, right, is that the future is digital and the past is real. Um, and so it's in that sense. And what does the future hold? Applications of various bits of collecting data, which is what blockchains are in an immutable sense. So I can make it short. Great, thanks. My Robert. students will appreciate that because it's never happened before. <laughs> Short and sweet. <laughs> um, I mean, blockchain technology is an amazing technology to be aware of, and it can definitely set you apart in a, in a job market. Uh, it definitely doesn't replace a Willamette education, I'll have to say that, but it's a good plus one, right? Um, 
But I mean, and I think more importantly, though, I mean, like, let's zoom out of blockchain. I mean, blockchain is one of many new technologies, one of many new innovations. And if you are in a job interview, apples to apples with another candidate, and you can speak to new technologies that could have implications at that company, the employer will remember you. Um, and what that is, is a growth mindset. So, I mean, if you have a growth mindset, you're thinking about blockchain, you're thinking about AI, you're thinking about all these digital implications, you're thinking about new business models, that's a growth mindset. And that alone, you know, will stay with you for your whole life. You know, maybe now it's blockchain, maybe later it's something else, but you possess this growth mindset, who wouldn't want to hire you? Um, also, you can use blockchain to your advantage because it's a little bit of a hot topic right now. Um, one quick story is when uh, we were doing a global search for Bitcoin core engineers, which were like, you know, super impossible people to find, um, had many recruiters on it. Uh, we found this one resume from a guy named JR, um, who ends up living 10 miles from my house. Um, but we were in the interview and we're talking about his experience and whatnot. And, you know, we kind of put two and two together. We're like, wait, so you did MasterCoin, now Omni, you built the protocol there, you did the token sales. So, you're like the inventor of the token sale. And he's like, yeah, I, I guess I am the inventor of the token <laughs> sale. <laughs> like, JR. So now we're like trying to hire the guy and, and uh, we're negotiating with him and he goes on his LinkedIn and changes his headline to inventor of the ICO. <laughs> So he milked us. <laughs> so my, my point is that that got him a lot. Um, so if you can do side projects, volunteer, intern, get on a project, one that is has some uh, uh, maybe some celebrity cachet attached to it or a differentiator, put that on your LinkedIn, put that on your resume, put that into your conversations, and it'll definitely set you apart. Great. Thanks, Neil. And I would say, too, that uh, we learned that actually you cap out LinkedIn at 30,000 followers because JR capped that out after his change. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the limit. Um, but so now we're going to do some Q&A real quick. Um, and we have a mic on the side here. And no questions. So OK, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll start here. One second. Go ahead. Yes. In uh, November, on November 6th in the New York Times, there was an article on the op-ed page entitled, A Safer Way to Vote. Do you believe that blockchain can handle our votes? Great. And could you give your name real quick? Just Ron Gustafson. Ron Gustafson. OK, perfect. Who would like to take that? Yes. <laughs> OK. I, I'll, I'll make a comment about that. Uh, and, uh, there's a lot of things that people want to put on blockchain, and uh, a lot of them are terrible ideas. And I, I would say voting, it's not the worst idea I've ever heard, but with the, the trouble with blockchain is like some guy in his underwear in Uzbekistan, if they find a hole in what you've built, they can rate it. If it's money, you know, a smart contract, they can steal all the money out of it. If you, if you make one mistake in your code somewhere that he finds some really corner case type of thing, if that's your voting system, like, I, I don't know. I, I would, I would, it would, it would have to be incredibly well tested before I would, I would trust blockchain with that. Yep. Blockchain is great for a lot of things, but the more complicated it gets, the more. You're trusting well, it with your money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the money side of it actually is really, really simple compared to what voting would be. In order to make these smart contracts, like you know, the, the, if you imagine the amount of code required to send money, it's like this much code. The amount of code to make a smart contract to do all the you know the things that people dream of, you know, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And every line of that code is like a door into your vault, right? Like, and, and if you want a, a vault, you want one door. And, and, and if you have a thousand doors, like one of those doors is not going to be good. And so, complexity theory would suggest that the simpler cases are the best. I do think, though, that you definitely need to support it and advocate for it. I mean, while it might Version one might not be perfect, but Ethereum's a smart contract and has $20 billion in it. So obviously, if you can hack that, there's a pretty good reward. Um, but you know, voting on the blockchain even with the current versions of them and the smart contract are better than battery-operated voting places in Georgia that run out of battery. I mean, <laughs> the problem is so big that even a potentially uh, not perfect solution could be better than the per initial solution. Great perspective. Solution. Thank you, guys. Um, Patty. Okay, next. Uh, the perfect solution is origin, vote by mail. You know, but, but anyhow, so you've got blockchain, which seems to be a process, and you've got Bitcoin, which seems to be some sort of a currency. My question is on Bitcoin. 
too. When I look at that graph, that is an emotional graph of value. Does it relate to, does the value of Bitcoin kind of fluctuate the way that the value of hard assets like gold and stuff fluctuates? Is that really where the value is coming from? Second question, if you invest in Bitcoin and you make money, where does that go on your taxes? How does that <laughs> translate to reality? Those great, are my questions. Great questions. I'll take the tax one. Hey, go ahead. Um, in 2014, the IRS was actually one of the first federal departments to make a claim about what Bitcoin is. And they said it's a digital asset. Um, I mean, of course, the department that's going to make a lot of money on Bitcoin is the first one to give us a definition. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so essentially, if you bought Bitcoin at $1,000, that's your cost basis. If you sold it for $10,000, you have a $9,000 capital gains. Um, so you pay tax on the $9,000 gains, um, according to whatever your capital gains tax bracket is. However, if you move to Puerto Rico and establish residency for six months, no capital gains. So <laughs> now Puerto Rico is becoming the crypto island, where <laughs> crypto billionaires, millionaires are moving there and you know trying to buy the airport and stuff. and. Uh, you know, looking for a tax haven. Professor, you have I'll a take, perspective I'll here. take the second part. Uh, yes, it's very much like gold. It's an asset, and its value is determined by uh, supply and demand. And given that there's a limited supply of Bitcoin, the greater the demand for Bitcoin will bid the price up. And if for some reason the demand for Bitcoin goes down, uh, that price will fall. But the but, questioner is basically saying that, like, demand is emotional. And, and I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that, right? No. I mean, no, I don't. I yep. agree. There's also a question Space. of like, what is value to begin with, right? But we can go there. So next question. <laughs> Says the marketer. I should. <laughs> <laughs> can you introduce yourself real quick? Hi, I'm Eric. I'm just a student here. Welcome, Eric. Not just a student. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, is it more difficult to hack into a blockchain infrastructure such as Bitcoin or more difficult to hack into a trusted third party system such as a bank? <laughs> Why do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> just just He's wondering. Science. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Who's Who's I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this. Uh, it, uh, so. Uh, I have a little bit of experience with hacking that I'm not going to talk about here. but. Um, <laughs> It, it, if you're choosing your target, you choose the cryptocurrency. Uh, and that is because if you hack the bank and you finally get in and you transfer the money out, they're going to say, oh, undo, and the money's going to come back. Uh, if, you, if you transfer cryptocurrency, there's no getting it back. So go after the cryptocurrency. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Does that make any sense? Next question over here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Mr. Burquist, you mentioned China banning. Um, banning Bitcoin and banning any kind of ICO offerings. Um, how do you think, or there's a rumor that China is trying to create their own crypto um, coin. How do you think that governments entering the market would change cryptocurrency? Yeah, that's a, a fascinating question and could very well put that on the list of classes to, to yeah. have here. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, the, I mean, China's going to create a centralized cryptocurrency is what people are speculating um, and so that they can, you know, control it. Um, but is the United States going to recognize that as legal tender? Um, one analogous example is Venezuela created the petrol coin, um, obviously to pay for their debt, which they couldn't pay for. And um, it was reported that the one of the the treasury managers was in Russia. They own a lot of they have a lot of debt owed to Russia, and uh, he tried to pay the debt in petrol coin, um, and Russia said no. Um, so you, a country could create a cryptocurrency backed by something, in this case, oil reserves. But the other question is, are other countries going to recognize it? And more often than not, the motivation for a country to create a cryptocurrency isn't always one that is recognized as a, as a valid or legitimate or globally healthy motivation for everyone else. Uh, so the United States actually has bans on countries uh, where we can transact and ban bans on cryptocurrencies that we can touch. Great. Thanks, Neil. Uh, and actually, we're live streaming, too, so we have a huge demand. We're full here. We have two more questions we can take. Um, first one here. Okay, pardon me. I'm a Lewis and Clark graduate, and I'm not as smart as most of you in this room. This whole conversation has been very abstract, 
But I came here tonight to learn what is blockchain and how does blockchain work. So perhaps, Professor Robert, could you explain with your pasta sauce analogy in terms that a Lewis and Clark graduate could understand? <laughs> and, and we will have follow-up after this as well, because we were going to a lot into this. How blockchain works, and don't be afraid to go very basic with me. He invented it, so I'm not sure. Uh, so, I mean, the basic idea behind it is, and I'm probably the least well qualified, so of course, right? But my job is professor, so I get to tell you stuff I believe, whether or not it's true, um, right? Because that's what to profess means in the sort of formal English language. All right, so the way I understand it, you have a essentially a something. So let's suppose we have like Bitcoin number one just to use it as kind of an analogy. And then Bitcoin number one has to be transferred to some place. It's a ledger that we're talking about. So it starts at some point. Some people own some stuff. What the block and the chain together do, think about the block as like an accounting ledger. Maybe it's a statement of accounts like at the end of some month. And then the chain part is how I go from this month to the next month. Maybe it's the way I enumerate all the cash that I have. And some of it leaves the firm, some of it comes into the firm, but it's all accounted for via a digital ledger. So what does blockchain ultimately do? It gives us a perhaps permanent and forever list of who owned what at a kind of consequential set of snapshots in time. And that may be every like instantaneous kind of moment in time, or at the very least, it's every moment until a new transaction takes place. Because everyone that owns everything still owns it until somebody transfers something to someone else. That was about the worst sentence I've ever uttered. <laughs> but so I don't know if that answers your question, but effectively what a blockchain is, is giving some stuff to some people and then chaining out how they trade it to other people over time. I, I think that captures it. Thank you, Robert. That's good. It's great. And I think we have one last question, and then again, follow up afterwards. But it's been great having you all here. Last question. Go ahead. The hash. Okay. I don't want to say that. Um, I'm an Atkinson graduate, so I and I'm also a ditch digger. I, you showed up a great thing where you showed all the processors. I understand server farms. I, we work towards building those. Are the Bitcoin miners the server farms? Where did where where did yes. all those processors come that keep the public ledgers that say that is authentic that's authentic you had numerous where's the infrastructure yeah. just when people are starting to understand blockchain now let's go to mining, <laughs> mining yeah. uh, one more hour. oh no it's good let's 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 go there because um, it's interesting and so basically when we talked about this decentralized ledger so back to the blockchain definition question the reason why it's decentralized because you have all these different servers, so no central control, unless you own all the servers, but no central control. Um, and those nodes are server farms. Um, so it's now in the business interest to get economies of scale, so massive server farms with really the way you win is cheap power um, and cheap hardware. Uh, so Washington State's done pretty well because uh, of the hydro. Um, so there's been some massive server farms there. Um, so essentially, they're able to then process transactions for cheap. Uh, and then the way, you know, we talked about there being 17 million distributed Bitcoins. There's 21 million supply. There's 4 million that is left to be rewarded. Well, the way Bitcoin incentivizes us to keep it alive, even though there's no central authority, is it has in its algorithm this reward mechanism. So if you plug in to the SHA 256 and process transactions, if your processing speed, if your hash rate is powerful enough, you <coughs> could win Bitcoin for free, except for the cost of power and processing. So because of this reward mechanism, it's created this ecosystem of servers all over the world that are plugged in to the algorithm as a node processing. And it's really a technology arms race. Who can have the most processing power at the cheapest expense? And those then, so you create pools where servers will team up because then if any one server gets the Bitcoin, it gets divided across all the servers. It's kind of like grouping up to buy lottery tickets. 
But essentially, so these all process the power, so or process the, the public ledger, and this is why it is a public ledger that's decentralized, is because it's reward system. Um, now, you might ask the question in 2140, once the rewards run out, then those processors, and they are now, they're getting fees. Mm -hmm. So if I send Bitcoin from one person to the next, there's a Bitcoin mining fee. And that's part of an equation based on how much computing power there is on the Bitcoin blockchain to know how fast it is to process that transaction. But last fall, when the price went up to 20,000, there was an insane amount of demand on the blockchain. So fees were through the roof. There were incidences where it cost over $100 to send $1 in Bitcoin because there's so much congestion. And the miners, being you know, business people, I guess, took the highest fees. And so if you only offered $2 to the miners to process your transaction, you, your, your transaction would sit unverified and for days, unless you were to pay the fees. That's one of the risks, but now mining processing power has gone through the roof. And the, the growth rate in the fall of 2017, if it were to have continued in terms of the number of server farms that are coming online, Bitcoin mining operations would have consumed 100% of the world's power by 2020. <laughs> and that's just how many people, because an internet connection and access to some hardware and cheap power, you're now an entrepreneur. And that, in, that really did uh, some interesting macroeconomic things in terms of creating a new economy for people just mining Bitcoin. Great. Thanks, Neil. I appreciate the panel. And applause here, and then Carol's going to take it over. Thanks so much, you guys. I think we're deep in the story now. So I, I expect several new novels to emerge from this, as well as a whole you know, career of people as miners and other things. So thank you. I, I hope we get to do this again sometime soon. Thank you so much for being here. We will send you a post-event survey sometime soon. We'd be delighted if you would fill that out and send it back to us. I guess it's a form of mining, you know. <laughs> we can find out what your interests are and, and try and do more things like this in the future. And we hope to see you again here very soon. Let's thank our panel one more time. <laughs>